everybody, and welcome in to the Auburn Undercover podcast on the 24-7 Sports Network. My name is Nathan King, joined here today by Jason Caldwell, as is our first game preview show of the year. Jason's been a long time coming. Um, I think this is probably, I was talking about this somebody yesterday, this, this, the first game week might be the longest week of the offseason because it's it so close. You can taste it. Um, I was talking to somebody at practice yesterday who was saying, like, it's it's starting to get to that point when when the the fan expectations and the excitement is almost boiling over um, to the point where uh, to the point where it's it's just time to play some football. It's time to to put all this conjecture and guesswork behind us and uh, and finally play some football, which Auburn will do on uh, on Saturday. And Jason, as Hugh Freeze noted today, it's actually going to be the biggest crowd in Auburn history um, because a it's a sold out game. B the, the stadium capacity has increased now. You would know better than me. Maybe some games in the past they've packed some extra people. Yeah, I, would, I would say 1989 Alabama is probably the largest crowd that's ever been in that stadium. 93 Alabama was pretty darn big too. There have been a couple that might they might have snuck a few extra folks in there, but on record, Saturday will be the largest crowd on record in Jordan Hare Stadium history. And, and I tell you what, you're right. This an it's an excitement build this week. You're right. It, this is the longest week because once you get into the actual game weeks. By the time you recap a game and think about the other game and get ready for the next one, you look up, it's already Thursday. There's no previous game. All these new players. I, I mean, I, I'm still sitting here, you know, three or four days before the first game and not really quite sure what to expect. Um, I think I have an idea. We, we've actually watched more of this team than we have a team in, in quite a while. But there's so many new guys that you just haven't seen those guys play before. Um so, I, you know, it's fun. It's exciting. Um, you know, here's one thing I do know before we get Garola, we'll get it. We're going to get into this team. I think we're going to see more players play in the first quarter than any Auburn team that I can remember. I think we're going to see 45 or 50 guys play in the first quarter. I really do. Um, and we'll see a lot of different guys rolling in rotations. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, it sure feels like we're going to see a lot of different bodies out there, Urban. Yeah, I mean, so many different position groups that did not rotate very much last year for whatever reason. Obviously, the defensive line was one that was always kind of puzzling to us, but there were other reasons, injuries at other spots um, that kept them kind of thin. Yeah, I agree with you. And injuries injuries right now are going to play a part in it um, as well. well. We'll get into those a little bit. I'm going to pull up uh, our injury report. Yeah, as Jason said, like we've seen so much of this team this preseason because on what is it, so we're recording this on Wednesday – on Tuesday, we got to see them practice um, on a game week. And, you know, Jason, you've been doing this a long time. And uh, it, it's the first time I've know, ever done it. I don't know how long it's been, um, quite honestly, since we saw a practice when they're actually in a season. Um, I mean, Gus Malzahn, we did a little bit there for a while, and then it just kind of phased out. I got to think it was probably when, – Nathan, when, when did you first start covering the, the team? 2018 was my first year covering the yeah, team. Yeah, it might have been 2016, 2017, somewhere around in there. So, I mean, it's been seven or eight years probably uh, since we've seen an in-season practice. I mean, yes, I mean, walking out there and seeing green scout team jerseys, pretty fun. Uh, I enjoyed seeing that part of things again. So, yeah, it's uh, quite different. Um, obviously, it didn't show a ton while we were out there, but you got to see at least – Hey, what the guys look like as they're getting ready for a game. And so, um, you know, I do, I have been impressed. We talked to players about it. We talked to people that have been watching some practices about it. The amount of 11 on 11 work this team has done has been far and above anything I can remember in quite a while at all. Um, just not as much of that done anymore. They have done considerably more 11 on 11 work in this preseason because of those new guys you, you just have to see you just have to see how guys handle football situations so they've done a lot of 11 on 11 situational work whether you know we're out there they did some goal line they put them on the goal line going in they put them on the goal line coming out um third and longs you do all those things that's how you prepare for a season they've done a lot more of that 11 on 11 work and we'll see saturday how much of that starts to pay off you're right out of the gate yeah, I was keeping an eye yesterday. Um, wasn't a very long viewing session, um, but like you said, Jason, it was obviously anytime it's game week, it's extremely valuable to take a look at it. Um, they they started splitting scout team about a week ago, so those guys are all in the green jerseys. Pretty much everyone you would expect. Obviously, you know Hugh Freeze's uh, comments on Monday about 
Uh, the depth chart is not necessarily indicative of of what the two deep actually looks like, or rather who's starting. Obviously, like you said, Jason, a lot of players are going to play. Pretty much everyone who's not on the two deep, maybe a few more, maybe a few less, just kind of give or take. Those are your scout team guys. So no no huge surprises there, I would say. Keeping an eye out for the injured guys that Hugh Freeze mentioned on Monday, along with the ones who have been dealing with things. So I'm going to run down the list here. The biggest name was Nehemiah Pritchett. So obviously there's, there's your starting corner. Um, he was not in pads. He was off to the side doing his own thing. Um, his left ankle was heavily wrapped. You and I were talking about it yesterday, Jason. Um, Kai and Lee is an awesome player and and is ready for this moment. They don't treat him like a true freshman anymore. But you had an interesting thought on maybe to go with a little bit more veteran of a lineup. I'm not saying Pritchett is out for this game because he wasn't in a non-contact jersey. He wasn't in yet. He was doing some work. Yeah. And, you know, three or four days can make a big difference. Sure. You're right. But, um, yeah, what do you do? I mean, that was the question we had, right? Um, what do you do there? Um, Kyan Lee is a guy. We're, he's going to play. He's going to play. We're going to see him. Probably going to see Colton Hood. I definitely think we're going to see Champ Anthony. Um, you know, but do you roll Keontae Scott to corner, maybe play a little bit more Donovan Coffin at the nickel early on, especially against this team with, you know, kind of that running quarterback a little bit with Tyson um, Pumachan a little bit. I know there are some options, um, but it – you know, if Nehemiah is limited or can't go, then it takes one of your veteran guys out, and you're going to have to depend even more on some of those younger guys, which are talented, but be a first time out for them. Yeah, you could definitely lean on that experience. Um, and Kaufman is – we saw him on the depth chart at safety, and we're kind of wondering because he was at nickel. It's what he's doing right now. We saw him at practice at that safety spot, so he's uh, he's been flip-flopping. A little bit, but he's got experience there, and so that gives them a that gives them pretty good pretty good four man safety rotation there, because um, they've got a, they've got a bunch of options there at the the fourth spot. Griffin Speaks is a guy um, that we talked about this week that Hugh Freeze talked about the Baylor transfer who's a walk on, but as we mentioned, the reason he's in that two deep behind Jalen Simpson is because although there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of young puppies as Hugh Freeze calls them at safety guys like Terrence Love, guys like C.J. Johnson. Um, you can't overstate the fact that was was he in Robert's system for two years, three, three years? years? Yeah, so all that, three years that knows what he's doing. Yeah, all three years that Ron Roberts was at, at, at Baylor, he was there. Griffin speaks his Auburn High School kid was a safety at Auburn High School as a senior. They moved him to, to quarterback and um, really an athlete playing quarterback, but I mean, he was a good he was a good quarterback, and so he's now back and so this guy that knows the defense he's smart he can get guys lined up he can make sure the guys understand the calls all that stuff so and he's been really beneficial for them in the preseason and you know a guy that will play some i think more on special teams we'll see griffin speaks i think we're seeing a lot of special teams but not a bad guy to have to stand over there and at a minimum answer a lot of questions a couple uh couple more like bigger injuries we'll get into and then i'll just hit down the line before we get into umass um you know freeze mentioned robbie ashford has an oblique strain he was full pads. He was doing everything. Um, but I did notice he had kind of some padding along the ribs there. Um, you know, of course, you'd, you'd hate for him to take a hit right there if that uh, if that's bothering him. Me and Christian were talking about it yesterday, Jason. And this is obviously a lot of um, guesswork when it comes to what his status would be and, and you know, how much he's going to play. But if you have this package for him and not, not even just a package, if you have it's a part of the offense, probably that's going to include him as a running and throwing threat. Maybe you can look glass half full if he's not able to do that much this week because you can keep a lot of that stuff off tape for for Cal, who is obviously going to be a much tougher opponent. So I'll be interested to see how much he's able to go on Saturday. Yeah, and, and you know, if you, there's still probably some things you can do. And honestly, you know, a bleak strain could be more impactful on throwing the ball maybe than even running it sometimes. Uh, and so maybe there's still some things you do. I, whatever it is, I don't think we'll see – a full amount of whatever it is from even Peyton Thorne in, in the game. There'll, there'll be some things they'll do, be some things they'll do with Robbie. Might see Holden Garner too. I mean, they're, they are listed as an or, so I think, but it kind of feels like probably a little bit more Robbie Ashford. But again, you're right. It may be a, a little bit limited, depends on how he feels. But knowing Robbie, the competitor he is, he was throwing the ball out there yesterday. That still gives you, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to get prepared for a Saturday game. So, um, my guess is it'll be okay unless there's a setback. The other big one is uh, and somebody that people have been really worried about, and for good reason, especially when Hugh Freeze brought him up on Monday. Um, Jalen McLeod, who I've used the word a bunch of times, but, I mean, a revelation for them at that pass rusher spot. 
um, this preseason, an ankle injury. We were actually at the practice when he was working and then kind of came off with a trainer and just stopped doing stuff the rest of practice. He was in a non-contact jersey for like two weeks after that, didn't scrimmage in the second scrimmage. Um, full go looked like yesterday. Didn't notice anything limiting him. No, no, no sort of protective gear or anything. And uh, you don't need him as much. Maybe he'll be limited a little bit. I don't know, but you don't need him as much this week. Um, you know, as, as many questions as Auburn's D line has, I think you can probably still rush the passer against UMass, but getting him healthy for Cal, like we were talking about for weeks, like get that guy to Cal, get Keldrick Falk to Cal so they can make an impact. Um, and speaking of the front seven, Keldrick Falk, he's all good. Freeze told us after the press conference on Monday, Austin Keys uh, went through their walkthrough on Saturday. He's all good there at linebacker. Um, a few more names I'll get to, Jason, then we'll we'll, we'll close out. Uh, Nick Marner is a guy that didn't scrimmage the second time around. Freeze mentioned him as being questionable. Uh, notice his right ankle was wrapped, but he was going. He so was he, out there. He was out there doing it. Um, Wesley Steiner, he's been in and out. Uh, his left knee was heavily wrapped, had a band as well. We'll see. Still going through everything. Um, yeah, and, and that's one spot where they've got they've got some guys there. Right. Those guys can play multiple positions. I think you know Cam Riley can play both. Eugene Asante can play both. Um, then you bring in Larry Nixon, and, and you got so you got some guys there at that position. I wouldn't imagine they'll push anyone on Saturday. Um, but yeah, you know, a guy like Nick Martiner, if he's still a little gimpy going into Saturday, you've got some depth at wide receiver. Wouldn't be surprised to say, hey, let's let's wait and get you healthy. But um, you know, that's kind of those wait and see games that you have to figure out maybe Saturday morning before we really know who will who'll be out there. Yeah. And then the other two um, that I took note of Camden Brown still has a band on that left hamstring, but he's, he's going, he caught oh, a good. touchdown in the second scrimmage. So mm -hmm. maybe it's a guy that falls into that category of you're talking about where let's not, let's not, uh, let's not push the throttle all the way in the first game, but he's one of their most dynamic players. They're going to want to get him healthy. And then JD rim was a guy who was, um, listed as questionable, saw him working, looked all good. But again, it, it, I think it comes back to, like you said, Jason, they're very thankful, I think, in this sense to not be opening, you know, Florida State, uh, you know, LSU. I think, I think they're very thankful to be opening with UMass because there's these are these are important players that are going to be key yeah. you know, come week two, week four against AM that they're going to need these guys. Yeah. And, you know, on the flip side, all, all things considered, been a fairly you know say knock on wood been a fairly good camp in terms of injuries that you know just kind of minor things for a few guys here or there so they've been able to avoid you know some some serious stuff for those guys and so um yeah you're 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 kind of amping up towards opening kickoff and I, again i'll i'll be surprised if most of those guys aren't out there and at least uh giving it a go and warm up to see how it goes quick note as well um that somehow just popped into my brain 13 minutes in i didn't even think about it um, I asked Hugh Freeze today on the SEC teleconference um, about Jarquez Hunter. Didn't want to do that on Monday when it's the big, you know, the big weekly press conference. I didn't want it to be a to be a big deal that people overreacted about. Um, but I did ask today, you know, kind of prefacing and saying, look, we, we've been I know a lot of you listeners you know, Auburn fans have been wondering, hey, he was you know, they said in the offseason there was a suspension for for student athletes. They didn't list who or confirm that he was on that. He obviously missed practice time at the beginning of camp. So I just asked you, Freeze, you know, is there a suspension attached to his situation or is he good to go? Um, and it, it seems like Freeze's policy is going to be not to disclose player availability. He said injury, suspension, what have you, is 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 not going to share that. Um, his full quote was, quote, I don't discuss who's playing and who's not. We hope everyone's healthy enough to play. We've got a few that are on that list that may go, may can't. But I'm just not going to discuss who's playing and who's not, uh, end quote. Jason, we were talking about it before we got rolling. Um you know, you could you could make a lot of uh, assumptions here. At the end of the day, this was an opportunity for him to shut that down and say, nope, he's good. He's going to play on Saturday. You've got maybe a competitive aspect of things, not wanting them to know if your best running back. I mean, Auburn's going to run for 250 yards, but you, you don't want to know your best running back. Um, at, but at the end of the day, though, we're, we're sitting here on Wednesday a little bit unclear on whether Jarquez Hunter is going to play. And it, and it is something to note just because so many people have wondered that. And this has been such a murky situation with, with very little clarity since it even started. Yeah. And you're right. It, it, you know, either way we'll, we'll find out Saturday and that's probably the way we're going to find out anyway. But, you know, I, I do think back to something that he free said really early he said, look, this is the only time we have a competitive advantage going that's into a, good a game. It's a really so good point. Probably more of that going, look, you know, so, hey, 
Uh, I've said, although we've said all along, wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't play Saturday. But I wouldn't be shocked to see him out there run the ball. I mean, he's he's been practicing. So, honestly, don't really know. I don't know that, you know, I mean, he's still been working with the first team. He's been out there taking reps, all those things. I don't know that that's anything that anybody might know until Saturday they get after game time. So, we'll find out probably, let's see, kickoffs at 1230. I'd imagine by 130 we'll have a pretty good idea when they start out there and start doing some warm-ups. Yeah, and it, yeah, and, and as people have said today after I posted that story, I mean, it's it's something we're going to find out about. It's sort of, you know, it, we're, we're sort of obviously just uh, continuing to touch on things. Something you need to about. ask, but in the grand scheme of things, there's not really much we can do about it now. Sure, and Freeze was fine. I think he, yeah. I think he obviously understood um, that that was going to get asked at, at some point. Anyway, Jason, let's talk about UMass. We're going to have um, Michael Traney on here on the pregame pod on Friday, so you guys can... Look forward to that, fightmassachusetts.com. I'm be honest, Jason, I didn't know we had a 24-7 UMass site until about two months ago. It's pretty awesome. This guy's been covering the program for a while, and so I'm um, very excited for that. But uh, this is a team that you and I and Auburn fans everywhere got an opportunity to see in week zero. Auburn also got an opportunity to see them in week zero, and that's something that Hugh Freeze admitted in his press conference on Monday. Look, that's an advantage. There's no way it's not. And the main reason it's an advantage right now is because of the the Clemson Georgia Tech transfer Tyson Pumachon at quarterback really changes everything. They didn't make a change at OC. Don Brown didn't change his OC, didn't change that offensive scheme or system or anything. Goes to show what a dynamic and experienced quarterback can do for your whole offense. Now they weren't perfect. Um, if New Mexico State doesn't turn the ball over three times, I, I don't think UMass wins that game um, because I think it was 8.1 yards per play for New Mexico State. So I mean, they were kind of doing a lot of what they wanted to do, both both on the ground and through the air, but they turned it over three times, um, 21 points off turnovers for UMass. Excellent win, great win. You know, first first road win for the program since 2018. Huge moment there for Don Brown, but you've got to think they went all out to get that one. It's not like they were holding anything back in terms of their offense. And Hugh Freeze said on, said on Monday, he said, look, they look a lot different. They were doing a lot of different stuff. A lot of it looks like what we're doing, so we're glad, we're glad to have a little bit of tape on them. Yeah. You know, Tyson Pumachon is a guy that got to see a Clemson uh, a few years ago. He actually played more as a true freshman than he did even the, the next, you know, the next little while there at Clemson. But he was a, um, he was the guy that was kind of in the battle with DJ Uyunglele that first year. Um, the other true freshman, the guy from the Northeast, went to Georgia Tech, and obviously they had a pretty good quarterback last year, and so he didn't play there. Now he's going back home, um, sort of, and, and now at UMass. And I mean, this is a six-four. You know, 210, 215 pound, big athletic guy, um, you know, can scramble around, can run, can throw. I mean, he was a highly rated quarterback coming out of high school. So this is a guy that um, is very different than what you would expect at a program like UMass. This is not the kind of guy you might find an offensive tackle. You might find a you know wide receiver or something like that. Very rarely will you find a quarterback at a school like this that looks like this guy does. And so um, that's going to be a challenge for the front for this Auburn defense, because what he'll be able to do is, is extend play some, um, you know, at Auburn secondary is a strength, but you can't cover all day. And so how do you rush the passer, but not give up a bunch of rushing yards to the quarterback? That's going to be the thing. Containment probably is going to be job number one for this, this, this front six or seven on this Auburn defense against a guy like Tyson Pumachan. I mean, and it, he's not alone on this offense. Um, Anthony Simpson is a guy that came in as a transfer from Arizona. And this guy is, is a power five SEC receiver. I mean, he's not a big guy. He's 5'11", you know, 185, 190 or so, but dynamic. They'll hand the ball to him. They'll throw it to him. Um, that's, to me, when I watched UMass a little bit, those are the two guys that I said, look, those are the two guys that you have to be really familiar with if you're all. I mean, to me, they stood out. I mean, you know, Karon Lynch Adams, um, they've got a bunch of running backs. But the other thing about this team, Nathan, when I look at them, from a size standpoint, you normally would think about a UMass team when Auburn's going to have a size advantage. All of, this is a pretty big team. I mean, um, they've got size at linebacker. they got size in the, in the backfield. Their offensive line is pretty darn big. Um, they don't have the big, huge physical wide receivers. But everywhere else, they're going to look like an SEC team, You know, maybe not down to 55 to 85, but their first group of guys, this is a pretty big physical football team. So 
I agree with what I've seen people around the country say. I don't know that anybody's going to be more improved football team than UMass was from last year to this year. And those two transfers, Pumachon and, and, you know, uh, the wide receiver, Anthony Simpson, kind of start that for me on offense. Yeah, it was a it was a transfer heavy effort. I believe twenty seven transfers for uh for Don Brown, eleven I think from Arizona, um where he was the where he was yep. yeah yeah was obviously the defensive coordinator there, um obviously long time long time defensive coordinator sort of made a big mark when he was uh, when he was at Michigan but also UConn Maryland uh, Boston College I think was his other um, stop a guy that Hugh Freeze has a lot of respect for he actually played him last year um, Liberty faced UMass they're gonna face him again. Um, this season, and look, they they scored forty two points. Liberty did, uh, but Hugh Freeze said it felt like twelve because of how difficult Don Brown makes things. And that's the other interesting aspect of this game when you're looking at UMass's defense. A lot like what Ron Roberts has done throughout his career, creative blitz packages, pre snap stuff. That's going to be a little bit difficult to decipher. If you're Auburn, you're very glad of all the things you've heard about Peyton Thorne pre-snap decisions, making the right read, making sure – my my thing that I keep going back to, talking about the defense this week that he's going to face, he puts other guys in the right spot, is something we've heard about. Now, he can't make receivers catch passes, and he cannot control if they break the wrong option route. And those two things are going to happen in this game. They're going to have they're going to have problems there occasionally. It's, it's going to happen. But that is going to be interesting to see because although this is a very talent-deficient defi- you know, defense when it comes to – going against Auburn. I mean, 11 on 11, hat on a hat. Auburn's offense is obviously a lot better. Um, but, you know, Hugh Free said, I asked him on on Monday, hey, how do you like to get your quarterbacks, you know, when you've got a brand new quarterback in week one? Maybe, you know, simplifying the game is, is a little bit too much of a cliche for me, but you got to get them comfortable throwing the ball. And he said, look, it's going to be tough. I like to do little hitch routes on the outside. Um, I like to get them easy throws in space. But with the way Don Brown likes to align that defense, that trap coverage, um, that, that Freeze talked so much about, it, it caused the pick six against New Mexico State. I think Auburn's going to have plenty of success on offense in this game. I would be surprised they didn't score more than 40 points. But I also would not be surprised if there's some confusion sometimes for Peyton Thorne pre-snap. If he throws an interception, I would not be shell-shocked. Yeah. I think there's going to be there's gonna be some stuff for them to work through, for sure. Well, here's the part of it, because you're you're running an RPO scheme, so you depend on the wide receiver to make the same read as the quarterback. If that doesn't happen, it can sometimes look like a quarterback mistake, and it might be a wide receiver mistake. Um, that's something that's going to be difficult against this type of defense early on. Um, you know, I think Auburn's offensive line should be pretty good. Now they haven't played together a lot, but you've got veteran left tackle, um, veteran center, veteran right guard. You got those three guys that have played a lot of football. Gunnar Britton is going to be on the field as a veteran somewhere. Will it be right tackle? Will it be left guard? You know, but then, you know, Jeremiah Wright's played football, Tate Johnson played football, Isaiah Miller, when he's in at right tackle, and I think we'll see him maybe right out of the gate. He might be starting, but I think we'll see him a good bit no matter what. He'll be really the only inexperienced guy that you throw out there against this type of team. But then you got Cam Stutz next to you that's played a ton of football. Um, That's where it'll be beneficial that you've seen guys that have played a lot, so that communication will be important for them. Um, But, yeah. Can the wide receivers and Peyton Thorne get on the same page against the defense that I watched and I saw in the first five plays, saw a four-man front, a three-man front, a five-man front. I saw blitzing on every play. Um, They're going to bring guys from all over the place, Uh, safeties, corners, linebackers, full house. They brought seven or eight guys on a couple of plays. There are going to be opportunities for Auburn, but can they pick up the blitzes? Can they get – if they do those things, then it could be a pitch and catch kind of game, maybe 10 times Saturday. If you make seven of those 10 in this situation, that could be seven big plays in the passing game, which would be mag- you know magnificent for an Auburn offense. There's going to be some opportunities there, but you're right. Can you avoid the mistakes? Because Hugh Freeze said, look, they're going to be negative plays. That's what they want to do. They want to create negative plays. Can Auburn avoid as many of those as possible Saturday? That's the key play of this uh, UMass defense. Yeah, they're going to gamble, and um, they gambled a bunch on on Saturday against New Mexico State. They got three turnovers. They got twenty one points out of it. They also got burned a bunch. I mean, there was there was some. I think they sent, like you said, I think it was a play. They sent seven or eight guys. 
Um, and there was a little bit of a sweep around left end. And I mean, that running back was gone from the, from the time he touched the ball because he had that opening a couple deep shots for, for Diego Pavia, the New Mexico state quarterback that Auburn's actually going to see them of course, later in the, uh, in the season. So like you said, Jason, you, you, you should expect a little bit of that, expect some negative plays, expect some, uh, you know, some issues here and there, but at, at, at the same time, it kind of goes back to the Auburn ground game for me. They weren't able to do much to slow New Mexico state. Um, this was a very bad defense. I want to make a note real quick. I keep hearing it, and ESPN said it incorrectly, and I think Hugh Freeze just ended up parroting what they said. UMass did not have a top 10 defense last year. They had no. a top 10 passing defense in yards per game, which is almost a useless stat yeah. because people re- did whatever they wanted on the ground. Yeah, they, so they, went from like, the they went from like 116 to in the 40s or 50s. I'm like, they did make an improvement. Sure. Something like that. But yeah, they weren't a top 10 defense. No. And we saw it. New Mexico State ran for 210 yards. Yeah. Um, they threw for 248. They had 458 yards of total offense in that game. Three passing touchdowns from a r- rushing touchdowns, but it was three turnovers. That's that's the key. If if we look up Saturday and Auburn has a game like they did against Mercer a few years ago, it's gonna be a tough game. If you avoid turnover Saturday, if you're Auburn, then then you will have done what you needed to do to, to start taking care of business. You read my mind, Jason, that Mercer game in uh, 2017, five That's turnovers for, for Auburn. Jarrett Stidham, um, you know, at the same time that he set the SEC completion percentage record, he also threw like three picks in the same game. And a couple of balls on the ground. And yeah. that, that's the thing you have to avoid Saturday. Um, and, you know, it kind of starts and ends there. Uh, for me, there's two things I'm watching. Can you avoid turnovers? And can you tackle on defense? Those are my two things. You do those two things. If you're Auburn, if you look up the end of the game, you go, man, we had a good tackling game. Then you're going to go, ah, yeah, defensively, you probably play pretty good. Yeah. And it's, you know, it. I'm glad to see it. And, and it's not unexpected to see it. I think Auburn fans have a lot of respect for these types of opponents because we talk about it every year. I mean, look at San Jose State last year that took Auburn in the fourth quarter. Obviously, they almost lost to Georgia State in 2021. You know, five of the last seven seasons, actually, Jason, in August or September, Auburn has played a non-Power 5 team that took them to the fourth quarter. But back in 2018, Southern Miss, that big lightning delay game, had the ball with the chance to take the lead in the fourth quarter. So Auburn fans have plenty of healthy respect for these sorts of games. At the same time, what you're talking about, Jason, I think it does come down to that. comes down to turnovers, comes down to taking care of the ball. You're going to give them way too many opportunities if you don't do that. Um, executing on offense, you know, it's freeze talked about it on Monday and I thought it was a very, um, practical sort of modern way to look at things. I think a lot of people are assuming that the ground game is just going to go insane on Saturday against a bad, bad, you know, a run defense that really, you know, a front seven that shouldn't be able to keep up against, against a bunch, even if Jarquez Hunter can't go a bunch of good Auburn running backs. Um, but free said, you know, you, I might come in here after the game and y'all might say, Oh, you only ran for 90 yards, but you threw for. 350 that is going to be an interesting development of this rpo game that i'm interested to watch because he's relying on peyton thorn yes to turn a running play into a passing play because he was as he talked about it's just not smart football to not take that one man advantage if you're all of a sudden playing 11 on 10 because of that read and you don't pop the ball out for a quick slant to, to shane hooks or, or jire shorter or javarius johnson you're just not playing smart football because now you've got an extra guy in the box that's trying to stop the run if you're going to hand it off. And so that'll be interesting to see. I, I'm interested to see how that sort of fleshes itself out. Um, and my, myself included, I look at this game and say, Auburn will just second half. If things get kind of dicey, just go, just go on the ground. That's probably true. They probably can just do whatever they want on the ground. Um, but while they're trying to run this offense, like they're going to need to do against better opponents. I am interested to see what, you know, what form that takes in terms of their, their run pass balance. Yeah, and, and I think it, that ties in perfectly to something we heard this week. We've heard from Hugh Freeze a couple of times. When he talks about wide receivers and and he used the words kind of loafing and talking about not I, – I think these guys have to understand, and I think it's taken a little while, that every play is a passing play. Um, like, that's the RPO game. Like, look, you've got to run like you're getting the ball every time. That's, that's how this thing goes. And so th- that's where it comes where – that you're going to play a lot of guys because, hey, in the past, you might have a running play called when a wide receiver is just kind of, you know, he's kind of jogging the ball off toward the sideline basically to run the DB out of the play. In this offense, he's running a route, and he better expect the football. And so I think that's 
taken a little little getting used to because that's not how most guys grow up playing the game. Uh, you like to think that everybody, you know, but you run a lot of wide receiver, and sometimes you're like, hey, man, it's running play right here. Now these are all plays where, hey, you better be prepared because this is an RPO game. It's an RPO scheme. That's the advantage you have. If you have a guy that makes the right decision and the quarterback makes the right read and the wide receiver makes the right read and they're going, okay, extra guy in the box, we got one-on-one -on -one here, we're throwing a slant or we're throwing the hitch or whatever we're doing, um, then you have an, an, an advantage on, on any defense if you execute it. And so that's how it starts. You got to be able to run the ball, no question about that, because that's how you get the extra guy in the box. So um, that'll be something to watch. I'm actually look, looking forward to seeing – how aggressive Peyton Thorne is going to be. Um, will you pull it a bunch and throw it? Because when you start running the football, even a quarterback's mind, you go, man, we just keep running the ball. We're okay. But I think they want him to go, look, no, we need to make that decision. If if you got the advantage, take that advantage and let's throw it. And so really interesting time. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's a situation where, there's going to be a lot of expectations. There's going to be a lot of excitement, I guess I should say, and some nerves in there. And that's something Hugh Freeze, you know, admitted today is that this is sort of a season opener like no other. Um, because I think when he came into the SEC at Ole Miss, you know, business like is the wrong word, but obviously it was his first go around in the conference. You know, he, he felt like he had to be one way. Now it's, you know, more than a decade later in his coaching career, he obviously understands the things he does and doesn't need to do when it comes to game preparation. And so obviously we're all excited to see uh, what sort of form that takes, even if it is a team like UMass. I think I think it's good that Auburn fans got to watch them in week zero because now they sort of understand. And some people are still just saying like, oh, Auburn will win by 50. But those people are always going to say that. I think people understand that this is an improved team on offense and that they're going to give Auburn some issues on, on Auburn's own offense because of their, their complexities there on defense. And so um, you mentioned it there, Jason, that's, that's one thing that I'm interested to see from Auburn that I want to see the receivers. Look, it was kind of overlooked on Monday. Like, I think he might've been the, in the middle of an answer on something a little bit more pertinent, but Hugh free said on Monday, you know, it might maybe some exaggeration, but he said, look, we're still running the wrong route half the time. <laughs> so, I mean, and they were dropping a bunch of passes on, on, on Tuesday's practice. This is a group still got a long way to go. Um, but like you said, Jason, it comes down to, look, he talked about it with Shane Hooks. It's the best receiver in the room. But what did he say about him? He needs to be playing 100% all the time. That goes back to your comment on always be prepared for it to be a, for it to be a passing play. Any play. Yeah, I, I, I look for the receivers, obviously. You know, what sort of a role does Robbie Ashford have? Is it injury related? Is it is it holding some things for Cal? You know, what does that look like on Saturday? That's going to be interesting for me. And then something we talked about at the very beginning of the show. How many different players are we going to see, particularly on defense? Because we've seen a lot of these kinds of games, and you know, a lot of times it's close. You know, against like teams like George State where they don't get to rotate. But like you said, even when it's not close, there's been some teams that haven't rotated very much, especially along that front seven. So I'm really interested to see what that group looks like. And mainly, we've been hearing so much about it from Jeremy Garrett, the D line coach, ever since the spring, saying how much he wants to do that and how much he wants eight or nine defensive line guys. What does that look like in a game setting? You know, how do you go? Is it is it in the middle of a drive? Is it drive by drive like Rodney Garner used to do? Um, that's just one thing, you know, we haven't seen it in a football game. So I'm interested to see what that looks like on the field. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. You go, okay, we, we feel like we're going to see all three edges. Our jack punt linebacker positions, Elijah McAllister, Stephen Singh, Jalen McLeod. So you start there and you go, Jason Jones, Justin Rogers. I think we'll see both of those guys. That's five. Then you go, you know, Lawrence Johnson behind Marcus Harris. That's seven. Messiah Nasili Kite, Keldrick Falk is, is nine. Probably see Zykevis Walker thrown in there. That's 10. Is there anybody else that makes a, a Mitch, uh, a, you know, gets into that mix? Do you see a sledge or somebody like that? I, I think we just, so you're talking about 10 deep, probably on that front four that you're talking about. And then you think about the linebacker group. I would say you see four or five guys fairly early, which gives you probably 15. And this is maybe on the low side a little bit. So you're talking about 15 guys there. Five guys in the secondary is 20. You get into a nickel situation, maybe play a couple of those young guys early on to get – so you're talking – I think we could see easily 21, 22 players on defense in the first quarter of this game, uh, you know, depending on how it goes. But the good news is, is that, knock on wood again, right now it's saying 81 degrees on Saturday. And so it's not going to be as hot as it absolutely could be. 
So that might give you an option to maybe not to roll as many, but I think we'll see those guys on defense. I think we're going to see seven, eight wide receivers um, for this team, four tight ends. We will probably see all four of those guys fairly early, um, you know, going in there, um, you know, three or four running backs, eight, eight offensive linemen. I mean, it's going to be a, a, a one, as we've said all summer, you know, if you don't have a roster, buy a program and keep it with you because there's a, it's a lot of new numbers, a lot of new faces that people, even though, you know, you're going to not get used to seeing that number out there. And um, so looking forward to it. You know, uh, Rivaldo Fairweather has been a guy we hadn't mentioned him one time. And he's been the guy that's probably been the most consistent player on this roster since the spring. I'm just not certain that they're going to, you know, uncase all the things he's able to do just quite yet. Yeah, if, if all the things he's able to do are what we saw in practice a couple times, uh, yeah, you leave that. You leave those sort of designs for, for the for the Cal game. And shoot, even sometimes it's not by design. Even sometimes it was yeah, Peyton Bourne correct. saying, "Well, I got nothing else, and you are way taller than those two defensive backs." So, just gonna put it up there. Uh, Jason, we'll close it out, and just you know, if if people want to read, everybody on our site will have their predictions for the game in the uh, the return of the fearless forecasters, which will be on Thursday, which is probably when you're. Listening to this, um, Jason, I, as you and I talked about this week, is it's this is not a betting podcast, but um, you know, 38 is a lot and it hadn't come down very much. It was 39 and a half when uh, when they were playing New Mexico State, and I thought it would come down maybe a little bit more. I'm also not informed about this stuff at all, but to me, as you brought up, 38 is a lot because if UMass gets in the end zone a couple times, which is not crazy, I think they probably no, no. might. Yeah. Um, you got to score a bunch of points in order to cover in that game. Yeah. And Auburn's offense, I think, will be good, but 52 is a lot of points to have to cover in this one. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. I I think it's going to be hard to to think about because I mean, this is a, a UMass offense that could have a big play or two because when you have a quarterback like that, that's that's the thing. You, you know, you, you 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 play man and you you blitz a guy and you don't corral Tyson Pumachon and you look up it's an, and it's a 50 yard run. Um, those are possible things on Saturday. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think Auburn wins the game comfortably, but I don't know that I would go, you know, 35-point win or whatever it is. I, you know, that's that's a lot, especially for a, for a group. Look, look, this is about preparing, winning a game, and then trying to get to week two. That, that's that's what this is about. There's no style points in week one. There's no style points for this Auburn team. Win advance and try to do it, um, you know, as efficiently as possible. Um, so um, I don't think we'll see a whole bunch. But hey, this is, you might seem like I said, if Auburn gives them an, a window and gives them a few openings, th- this is a team that can make this one interesting in the second half. And um, I think it's all up to Auburn. Yeah, I think it has a good chance of being – you know, seven, 17 to 10 in the in the second quarter and people look at the score bug on ESPN and say oh might be a little interesting but then you know Auburn has I think too much talent especially running the ball um I think once we get once we get to the point where we're in the third quarter and that defense starts rotating like we were talking about it's an offense been on the field a long time even you, you mentioned it this week it's like Auburn's second offensive line if they get a chance to play those guys are really good and those backup running backs are really good how tired is that UMass defense going to be at that point? Can they can they hold up? Um, I picked in our in our piece. I picked forty five to seventeen um, for Auburn. I would not get, like give or take a touchdown either way. I would not be surprised if it's thirty eight seventeen. Would not be surprised forty two to twenty four. Would not that's be surprised. I did, did thirty eight seventeen. I just yeah. I, I just you know I, I think Auburn. I think that's comfortable and maybe a late score by UMass to kind of do that. But uh, I just don't see a situation where Auburn wins this by 35, they do. Then in my opinion, that would show that I think Auburn's always said his offense. I think this offense can be fine. Um, wide receiver group, as you narrow down the offense, maybe by Saturday you get into some plays and situations that, okay, instead of running, you know, two thirds of a playbook, you get down to uh, a fifth of it. You go, okay, what do you want? What do you do the best? Then it allows you maybe to do some things instead of trying to do everything. 
So that might help some. But I, if Auburn wins by that much, it would show me that defensively and especially defensive front, probably a little bit better than we than we thought they were coming out of camp. So that'll be the thing for me. Um, you know, if Auburn's able to do that, it'd mean defensively, then this group is, uh, has gone out there and played pretty well. Yeah, you've got to think Puma and Sean will have an opportunity to – He'll have an opportunity to run a little bit. And, uh, you know, Eugene Asante talked about it on Monday. That's, you know, the gap integrity for the linebackers has to be the number one thing. They're, they're used to Robbie Ashford as a running quarterback. I think that can help a little bit. Now, he's not. And I took some heat from saying that Puman Chan is a little bit more physical on our board. People were saying, oh, Robbie's about the same size. Yeah, sure. But play style, very different. Um, this is a guy that does not mind putting the shoulder down, going in the gaps. Now, Robbie does that plenty. All that is to say that I think maybe there's some advantages in terms of that preparation. I keep coming back to my biggest thing is the film. Uh, Somebody posted the other day about uh, against the spread. It was like teams that play in week zero playing a team that has not played yet over the past three or four years. I mean, against the spread, they are just horrendous. Like it's, it it, it makes such a big difference. I think having that tape. Um, And so I think that's going to, I think that's going to give Auburn a good chance. Obviously I don't see this being a game that will be close in the second half. Um, but I do think it's a game where Auburn is going to have some things that are uh, that are tested and challenged enough for them to get back in the film for Cal and say, all right, we got the stuff to work on. It's not going to be 63 to nothing where you're kind of throwing your hands up on film and Monday and saying, well, we got nothing. To, we got nothing to really touch on. I think they'll have plenty of that to, to work on for the Cal game, which will be I think will be a really good game. And I'm interested yeah. to see what happens with that one. Yeah. Of course, they, they play North Texas. They're only a they're only six point favorite. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Um and it's it's here. It's time. I think everybody's excited. It should be a great Saturday, and you know we'll see what happens. That's all. It's the, the kind of the you know that talking season, as they say, the talk the talking season's about done. It's time to to see what this team is all about and how much uh, how much this forty some odd newcomers makes um, to impact this football team. It's it's somehow you know simultaneously flown by while also dragged along. This has been such a long off season because there's been so much anticipation. At the same time, I feel like it was this morning that I was that we were in that room talking to Freeze and Cadillac after he got named the head coach. And so, um, you know, like you said, it's finally here, and uh, we get to we get to put away all of the offseason talk and start talking about actual football, which is a wonderful feeling. So, um, thank you guys for joining us today. If you uh, if you listen through all of that, bit of a lengthy first show here, but we had a good time uh, previewing again some actual football that's going to be played on Saturday, two thirty on ESPN, two thirty Central Time. On ESPN proper, no SEC Network Plus, no ESPNU, no nothing. Auburn fans, you're getting <laughs> you're getting ESPN. And like Jason said, the weather that's that might be like this. Watching Auburn, watching this team for the first time is number one excitement, and then the weather is number two because uh, it's been absolutely brutal here. We walk by players every day that you know, guys from like Florida and guys from Texas that are used to the heat. They're like, man, this is so different because the humidity has just been wild. So, uh, so man, they, I think they lucked out, and uh, it's going to be a good going to be a good one there on Saturday. And so uh, for Jason Caldwell, I'm Nathan King. Appreciate everybody listening. If you enjoyed it, go leave us five-star reviews. It's the number one thing that helps us. Bumper music is by Beats by Mordecai. You guys can follow him on Twitter, SoundCloud, and Instagram. And until the next time, see you guys later. Everybody have a great rest of the week.